Okay. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to get us started. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce you to uh, Dr. Brent Blewett, who is with Stanford, and he's going to do our Lunch with Docs with us today um, for HD. And just to give you a little background, um, Dr. Uh, Blewett is a DO, and he graduated from medical school um, in Toro University um, with osteopathic medicine. And um, he completed his residency at the University of Texas Southwestern at Austin. Um, during that time, he was resident chair of Texas Neurological Society. Afterwards, he went on to obtain a fellowship in movement disorders from the University of California, San Diego, and um, is now working at the Stanford, um, at, at Stanford uh, in the Movement Disorder Center. He is trained and skilled in the administration of botul botulinum toxin injections, deep brain stimulation programming, is a member of the Parkinson's study group, the Huntington study group, um, the National Ataxia Foundation, Dystonia Medical Research Foundation, and recently helped uh, develop the Cure PSP Center of Care, um, which is a national initiative dedicated to increasing access um, to care and advancing research initiatives for PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. And um, at some point, we'd love to have you on uh, to talk about that as well. Okay. Um, he has an extensive um, experience, not only in providing care, but in research and um, is um, just an incredible contributor to um, the conversations and living well uh, with um, movement disorders. So today he's gonna talk with us about um, an overview and update on the management of Huntington's disease, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, as always, please feel free to write your questions either directly to everybody in the chat, or you can also feel free to um, you know, type them directly to me if you'd like them to be private, and I will read them to Dr. Blewett. So welcome, Dr. Blewett. We are looking forward to learning from you. Take Thank it away. You Thank, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor. Um, I, I want to go over kind of a Huntington's disease and overview and also kind of the management, including some up-to-date treatments that are being proposed and, uh, and, and just some future directions for the, for the disorder. So, so um, we'll talk rather casually, but um, at the end there will be room for questions as well. So, so Huntington's disease uh, is a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, it is defined basically by uh, the loss of certain kind of brain cells um, that are in the basal ganglia. Uh, the basal ganglia is the area of the brain that's responsible for movements. Uh, the key movement that people see with Huntington's disease is something called choreiform movements, which are kind of abnormal, writhing, slow, uh, uh, involuntary movements of the body. Um, chorea is one of the most common symptoms of Huntington's disease. Um, so everyone has a Huntington gene. The Huntington uh, gene makes the Huntington protein. This is a normal protein in the brain. We're not sure exactly what it does, uh, but it does have normal purpose inside of the brain. Um, unfortunately, with Huntington's disease, there's a mutant Huntington protein that is created. And so uh, the faulty gene can be passed on from one generation to the next. Um, each child of a parent with Huntington's disease has a 50% chance of developing Huntington's disease and is, a, is an autosomal dominant disorder. The chain of risk can be broken if the child does not carry that broken, that, that faulty gene. So there's a, it, they call it a trinucleotide repeat. The, there are three different, there's four nucleotides within the DNA code. Uh, the three ones that are involved in Huntington's are cytosine, adenine, and guanine. So C, A, G, first letter for each of those three words. And then you get the trinucleotide repeat expansion. Um, there should be less than 26 of these C, A, G repeats for, for the Huntington protein. Um, if there's 26 or fewer, it's normal. There's no Huntington's disease. 27 to 35 may not cause Huntington's, but the parents carry a small risk of passing on the faulty harmful gene uh, to their children. 36 to 39 may cause Huntington's disease later in life or not at all. And 40 does tend to cause, 40 definitively causes and it is a diagnostic for Huntington's disease. The reason is over 40 of these CHE repeats 
creates a longer version of the Huntington protein is easily fragmented. They can clump together and they deposit in the brain and cause the symptoms of Huntington's disease. So there's really a triad of symptoms that, that is for Huntington's disease. And I always picture this triangle that people use. Um, at the top is the most obvious, that's the movements, the chorea. And, and there's also occasionally ticks in juvenile Huntington's disease. Juvenile te uh, technically means less than 25 years of age. Uh, it's, it's very common that, we'll just take a brief uh, break. With juvenile Huntington's disease, the presentation's a bit different than standard uh, Huntington's disease for adults. Um, there can be seizures, ticks. Um, it's harder to diagnose. It's not as obvious. Um, and the course of the disorder may progress more rapidly in juvenile Huntington's disease because with each generation, there's something called anticipa anticipation. Anticipation means that the number of CAG repeats expands with each generation. So generation one may have 41 repeats, pass it along to their child. They can have 52 repeats. Generation three may have 60 repeats, can extend and keep going. The higher the number of the repeats, usually the, the higher the level of diseases of severity. So again, uh, going back to the triangle, at the top there's the motor symptoms, and that's usually chorea, but again can be at ticks or also seizures. Uh, but most commonly it's chorea in the adult population. Now, then on the bottom corner of the triangle over here, there's emotional or behavioral disturbances. Over here, there's cognitive disturbances. Now, technically, usually the most common presenting symptom is usually behavioral disturbances. And these can be very subtle. It can be impulsivity, uh, change in personality, change in something called executive function, which I'll discuss a little bit more in depth. Um, but there are things that you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, this is obviously Huntington's disease. So these can occur for decades before the actual motor symptoms uh, or cognitive symptoms start up. The cognitive features are, are somewhat similar to Alzheimer's, um, although not as prevalent or, or uh, in, interfering with the, the activities of daily living. So it's usually short-term memory loss, um, as with, uh, it's an amnestic cognitive deficit is the, the term for that, which is memory loss. And, and that's usually what happens more commonly in, in Huntington's disease. And so, so going back to those executive functions, there are seeing things like concentration, thought organization, working memory and cognition. Uh, other things that can be affected are communication and language, understanding language, uh, starting a conversation, articulation, difficulty interpreting facial expressions and word finding difficulty, which we also see in Parkinson's disease too. Decision making, again, the impulsivity, regulating emotions or disinhibition, and also problem solving difficulty can be a problem as well. Um, in regards to the mood, some of the symptoms that people can have are apathy, depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, personality changes, repeating the same thoughts, aggression, irritability, compulsion. There can be psychosis that's not normally early in the disorder that can happen later on, and that can manifest as hallucinations or delusions. Um, depression is a very common symptom of Huntington's disease and can appear early in the course of it. Um, there's, there's one observational study that we do called Enroll HD, and uh, this has been going on for years, and uh, this is looking at the longitudinal course of how Huntington's disease tends to progress. And they have thousands of subjects. They're, they're basically creating this repository of data so that we can learn more about the disorder and find ways to intervene in it. And, and I've conducted some of these, these studies myself, and it's very interesting, you know, you talk to somebody who was diagnosed in 2014, but really when you dig back into the history, oh, um, there was a little bit, there was some depression back in 2004. Um, I'm not sure if it was related and it oftentimes is. And it's this, this slow developing of Huntington's disease. Um, it's an, an ominous sign uh, for an ominous disease. Um, I'm going to go off. I do have a, a PowerPoint I'm semi reading off of, but I want to tell you as a, as a human, uh, Huntington's patients are possibly the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. I have uh, a family, um, obviously I won't violate any HIPAA or anything, but, but uh, it was a, a mother with, with two sons with Huntington's disease. And three years after the, both of the sons were diagnosed with Huntington's disease and their symptoms were rather severe, they still found the time to go to Mexico to build houses for poor people. And to me, that, that just breaks, I mean, it breaks my heart and also lifts my spirits and makes me, motivates me to do more than I already do um, every time I think about that story because they were still kind in the face of their, their disease. Um, and I see that every day when I deal with people with Huntington's disease. 
So again, prior to diagnosis, the research shows that emotional, behavioral, and cognitive changes may occur up to 15 years before the onset of motor symptoms and the clinical diagnosis. And then there's three different phases of Huntington's disease after the diagnosis is made, and that's early, middle, and late. Um, some symptoms may vary uh, in regards to severity, others steadily get worse. And in the middle stage, that chorea tends to be the most prominent symptom. So chorea is often, uh, it's often troublesome. I have a motto for my patients. If it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So if it's mild chorea and it's something like this and, you know, it's just, it's just kind of the way you roll, then that's okay with me. If it's getting to the point where you're walking and the chorea is causing that normal imbalance and you could fall, then I have a more serious conversation because that can hurt you. And my job is obviously as a doctor, first thing, do no harm and just take care of people. So, so that's when I'll usually intervene. Now, for the chorea, there was technically one medication that was always on the market called tetrabenazine that's been on the market for years. What that does is it depletes dopamine. There's a, a certain chemical, uh, it's a transporter with the neurons which transports dopamine from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic. This depletes the dopamine in the presynaptic terminal. Um, the problem with tetrabenazine previously was that it had a black box warning of suicidality and depression. And it's already a problem in Huntington's disease patients. So how can we get around that? So for decades, there really was no way to get around it. Um, additionally, a lot of uh, patients told me that when they were taking it, it would cause a lot of sedation. So, so that was a big problem for the medication as well. Um, so, you know, the, I have another motto, which is every medication has a side effect. So, so you always have to balance out what you want with your medications. Does the good outweigh the, the bad? Um, regardless, uh, tetrabenazine was on the market for a long time, but recently a new FDA approved medication came out that's called dutetrabenazine. What they did, I'll, I'll keep this simple, uh, this, nobody really wants to hear about this, the scientific background. It's, it's a deuterated version of the tetrabenazine. What deuterated means it has a stronger bond, and so therefore it lasts longer. The tetrabenazine would kind of work for four hours, then stop, and then you have to take it again, and it stops. When you have medications that work in a shorter time period and not over a long, like a whole day, there's more side effects. So the dutetrabenazine is a lower side effect profile um, and lasts longer in general. Uh, the pharmacokinetics are such that it doesn't peak as high, it gets to here, but it's steadier. It doesn't cause all the side effects and the problems. This medication was approved uh, about one and a half years ago for the treatment of Huntington's chorea, for the management of Huntington's chorea. Um, I, in my anecdotal experience, I, I will support this medication. It does work very well. Other medications, again, there is still tetrabenazine for the treatment of chorea. Um, the do tetrabenazine has a much lower incidence of uh, depression, suicidality uh, in their clinical trials. Um, so it's, a, it's just an, a, a simpler way to, to treat the chorea without causing problems. Um, classically also, there's other studies that have been performed on other medications like amantadine, which is uh, used for excessive movements in Parkinson's disease. Uh, this has been studied with, with chorea and Huntington's disease and does show some promise, but it has not been FDA approved for the treatment of the chorea. Um, also, another way to, to treat the chorea is to use uh, mood stabilizing medications. Uh, most commonly in my experience, it would be aripiprazole, um, also known as Abilify. Um, and this medication can cover the mood symptoms, but also the motor symptoms of Huntington's disease. And uh, therefore you're, you're getting two birds with one stone. You can help the depression, but you can also help the chorea. You can also stabilize the mood, help the movements. And so, so that's always a good way to go because I'd rather give one medication than two. Uh, so, so that's gonna make life easier. Um, in regards to the, the mood uh, manifestations of chorea, oftentimes we will use uh, antipsychotic medications. It has a terrible name, antipsychotic, also known as neuroleptics. Um, they're really mood stabilizers for the most part. That's what their goal is. The complication of these is that they deplete dopamine as well. So although they can help reduce some of the movements, after many years, they could potentially cause some Parkinsonism. Parkinsonisms are all caused by a depletion of dopamine. So, so you're taking, it's again, these, this, this teeter-totter of medications. Uh, you're helping your mood and you're helping your, your emotions, but at the cost of what? And uh, over 10 years, you, I would say five to 10 years at higher doses, that, that is a concern for Parkinsonism. 
Um, honestly, if I were taking one and had Huntington's disease, I wouldn't worry as long as I was on a low dose and my doctor was monitoring at every visit for the potential for Parkinsonism. If we see that on examination, we can remove the offending medication and it should resolve that. Uh, it can take some time to do that. Um, other complications of Huntington's disease can include swallowing and speech. Um, there are two things we do not want anyone with Huntington's to have happen. No falls and no choking. Those are the two no-nos. So physical therapy is a huge benefit. So is speech therapy, especially a swallow evaluation. Um, one, one kind of uh, a trick that a patient taught me actually is if you're having problems with uh, drinking uh, uh, excuse me, liquids, that you can use something called Thicket. Thicket is available in any pharmacy. You can put it into any kind of uh, to drink and it, it thickens it up. And so you're, there's less likelihood for silent aspiration, which is where a, a thin liquid can go down the wrong pipe and cause a lot of problems. So, so that's, that's a very important. And I would say the two most important things to, to look out for with Huntington's are these falls or the choking. Um, mood is often difficult to handle. Um, and that has to be coordinated with both the person with Huntington's disease and their family. Um, I, I do think that Huntington's disease in general is best handled by a movement disorder specialist, although there are many competent general neurologists who could do so as well. But it's always good to be up on kind of the latest version of what's going on in the research world and then what new, new treatments there are. Um, so that, that would be probably my, my overview and management for Huntington's disease. I, I could say more, but I want to open this up for, for questions because I think there's a lot of people who are waiting to ask uh, questions. Is, is that a good idea, Sarah? Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, one question is there is a new study happening for treatment, a new treatment perhaps, or um, for Huntington's? And I'm curious if you can shed some light on that. I've seen some stuff recently. Yeah, I'm very, very, very glad you asked. And so I think the, the world is literally a buzz of HD. It's on HD buzz. Um, so, so there's a, a new clinical trial, and it is called Generation HD. Uh, it is being conducted by Roche. And uh, this is an antisense oligonucleotide uh, study. I have a very simple way to kind of explain the scientific aspect of that. DNA, this is genetics 101, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes a protein. The protein can be expressed as your muscle, eye, hair, et cetera. Uh, the RNA also produces that, that Huntington protein. So what the antisense oligonucleotide does is it bonds, they call it antisense because it, it bonds to the sense. So antisense and sense come together. It blocks the RNA from making the, the mutant Huntington protein. They've shown already in the phase one and phase two trials that it reduces the amount of mutant Huntington protein in the cerebrospinal fluid by 40 to 60%, which is a significant amount. Um, now the phase three trial is to see if there actually is uh, a reduction in the motor symptoms um, of Huntington's disease. Um, it's extremely promising for a number of reasons. <clears throat> uh, number one is it's already worked for a different condition. There's, there's something called spinal muscular atrophy. And this is a horrible condition. It affects uh, infants three to five years of age. Uh, and they, they tend to, to lose muscle tone and, and, and basically cannot walk, cannot move, and cannot breathe. And it's a horrible disorder. So, uh, that was invented and, and created a, a bit ago, and it's, it's uh, being given the same method intrathecally uh, in, in through the cerebrospinal fluid, and that's already shown extreme promise uh, and actually does work in the SMA. So now, it's, it's, it, when I see something of that nature, I get more excited than when, when they say that it works in a mouse model. Uh, it's already worked in humans, and so, so this is definitely very exciting. I believe currently, I'm, don't quote, I think 15 sites are active in the United States. Um, I would uh, just Google online for Generation HD and, and uh, look for your local site if you are interested uh, in participating. Wow, that's incredible. So it could actually reduce it for people who currently have it, but then wouldn't it also, like, if you have a child who maybe isn't even symptomatic at all, but, um, and you, I mean, it has, it, that has incredible potential. Incredible, incredible potential in so many different ways. Incredible potential for the, the disorder. Also incredible potential for what do we do now? Because um, if this does work, this, this will 
potentially eliminate the symptoms of Huntington's disease. However, it doesn't go back into the DNA and actually remove the Huntington that the, the CAG repeats. So the disorder would still be passed along, but then there's a treatment. There's a ton of ethical considerations uh, in Huntington's disease as to whether or not somebody should pass along this, this, this gene. Um, it's, it's oftentimes a, a mutual conversation with a genetic counselor to determine this, but uh, that's something that needs to be discussed as well after, after the results of this trial to see if, this, if it does happen, if, you know, do, we, do we still put the same limitations on, on having children, et cetera. Wow, that's I mean that's incredible. Okay, we will include that too in our in our newsletter in our e newsletter um, about yeah generation HD. You said yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. Okay, sorry, I'm I'm just that's just amazing. So I do no, have two questions I'm, sitting no. here. <laughs> I, I'm 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 I, I'm acting calm right now. I'm more excited about this trial than I've been about any clinical trial that I've been a part of. Um, it's 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 extremely exciting. Yeah, and to think of something, I know that oftentimes the breakdown is, you know, the mouse and then the human, and there's right. the breakdown, right? So, yes. um, wow, that's that's amazing. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah, it really okay. is. Yeah. We will stay in touch with you about this for sure. And, um, you know, as we go forward, we would love to just have any updates. I'm um, happy, happy to give updates, happy to promote this trial. Um, I'm very excited about it. And again, I'm, I'm very, I'm passionate about the HD population. So I'll definitely give updates. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. So I have two questions. One is uh, my father has Huntington's disease. Is there a test that can tell me if I will get the disease? My brother was just diagnosed, but doesn't want the rest of the family to know. Do you have any ideas on what I can do, how, what I can share with him to help him accept his diagnosis? Yeah, this, this is a great time. Um, I, I first have to give a disclaimer that you know, obviously there's there's legalities in all of this, and so so I think uh, any both of these questions you should have an appointment with a genetic counselor. A genetic counselor will be able to to accurately identify individual situations and to sit down with you and tell, and go through the individual nuances. In a, in a Q and A session like this here, though, I'm still happy to answer. Just to understand that that genetic counseling will still be the the best way to go. Um, but in regards to uh, my father has Huntington's disease and you, you would like to know, this is fairly straightforward. Yes, you can know there's, um, there, there's a genetic test again. So this is uh, looking for those CAG repeats. And if there's more than 40 CAG repeats, that is indicative of a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. So it's a, it's a simple blood test. I would recommend getting genetic counseling before you have the blood test to discuss possible implications. Um, that, that would be for the first question. In regards to the, the brother, um, in, in medical legal uh, situations such as this, it is up to him. If he's still uh, competent and has capacity, then yeah, he, he can hold on to that right uh, to not disclose that. Um, I believe that that is the, the legal, uh, uh, the legalities of that situation. Uh, so I, as, as a human being, I kind of believe that, that we need to, to work with everybody who's as an individual and respect their opinions. And so um, to be honest, it sounds like a complicated situation, one where maybe the family wants to sit down or maybe you want to sit down with them individually. It sounds as if though he's, he's mentioned this to you. And, uh, and I would talk with him about that. For, for something that might make him more willing to open up about it is this clinical trial. Um, the fact that there are ways you can manage Huntington's disease now and potentially a cure. Um, that's really what this represents. And so, so, uh, so I, it gives me hope. I hope that it gives people with Huntington's hope and I hope it gives your brother hope as well. Mm, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, it really does give hope, doesn't it? To be able to just know that there's possibility and that there's an advancement, but um, you know, in a, in a really complicated disease. So um, what is the diagnostic process before, um, before a diagnosis is actually made? So you talked about the blood test, but mm -hmm. what kind of process would somebody um, expect to go through? Yeah, so, so it can be a long and winding road, again, because there are sometimes these vague symptoms and you may have, you know, it's, I, I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the medical mill of having to see eight doctors and, and you know, take given 10 medications and, um, so it's hard. It's difficult. Unless you present with over Korea, most likely your physician's not going to be able to tell you you have Huntington's disease. Um, and additionally, Huntington's is fairly well known. I had heard about Huntington's before I went into this field. Um, but there are a lot of doctors who aren't really aware of it and what, it, what the symptoms are. 
And so you can go see a good doctor who's good in their, their field, but then they're not knowledgeable about Huntington's disease and, and they can misdiagnose or not diagnose. So the most obvious way is if there's chorea, if there's these abnormal writhing uh, choreiform movements, a lot of times also it'll be kind of a restlessness, just kind of a needing to move. And I don't want to over, be overly sensitive to the point where everybody starts worrying that they have these symptoms. But, but these, are, these are kind of markers that I've seen in my, in my experience. Um, point being, the next logical progression would be to, if your physician identifies uh, symptoms that are potentially indicative of Huntington's disease, uh, movement disorder specialists are managed and are trained specifically in the management of Huntington's disease. And I, I would recommend uh, a movement disorder specialists uh, to take a look at the situation. There's a specific scale that we do. It's called the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, UHDRS. And we do that to, to examine for the specific motor abnormalities that are involved in Huntington's. Giving a very long answer, I'll kind of summarize this. Um, essentially, somebody has to identify there might be Huntington's. At that point in time, request a movement disorder specialist. A movement disorder specialist would examine, and if there was the potential, they would then proceed with a genetic uh, uh, counseling appointment to discuss whether or not you should get the, the, the test to see if you do Huntington's disease. That's great. Can you, you know, you've mentioned the uh, movement disorder specialists, which of course we are really um, passionate about making sure that people understand um, that there is actually a, a specialty even beyond neurology, um, but, and, and that people should, we believe would be best served by making sure they're connected to a movement disorder specialist. Can you explain a little bit about what that difference is though for people who don't maybe know? Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Movement disorders, so there's about 10 subspecialties of neurology. Uh, most commonly, people think of stroke and seizure because those are the most common disorders. And then there's, there's less common uh, neuromuscular, uh, multiple sclerosis. Movement disorders is, is obviously my love. And uh, so I, I, I'll tell you my personal experience as well. I had a, a fork in the road where I could either go, I was looking at stroke or movement disorders. I wanted to be in a neurological subspecialty where I could make a difference, where I could help people and significantly improve people's lives. Um, the old uh, joke of, doc of neurologists is that we diagnose an adios, and that's a terrible thing. And so I don't want to say, here's what you have. I can't do anything about it. So the movement disorders for me was a field I could go into and make a difference. And, uh, and I, I feel like I am. I hope I am. And uh, so the, the, the movement disorders kind of encompass either hyperkinetic or excessive movements or hypokinetic, which are de deficient movements. The only real hypokinetic movement disorder, the most common one, is Parkinson's disease. Um, that's definitely something you should have managed by a movement disorder specialist. Um, just because of the, there's a new medication every three months. There's a lot of different surgeries you can get, procedures, things of that nature. Um, then there's, there's hyperkinetic movement disorders, dystonia or abnormal muscle contractions, ataxia is imbalance, a lot of tremors, we see a lot of those, um, and Huntington's disease. And so, so our subspecialty deals with the kind of the multidisciplinary and multifactorial aspects of this, not just the simple motor aspects. Um, we oftentimes get into a little bit more involved and talk about some of the, the other associated features of the disorder, which can help people. Um, it's also good to be clued in with the kinds of physical therapy. Um, Huntington's really needs something like Parkinson's has. There's, there's something called LSVT Big. It's Lee Silverman uh, voice training actually, but it's for, for movements. And uh, they have that for, for speech in, honey, in Parkinson's as well. Um, so it's good to kind of get into the specific uh, uh, nuances and to get in those crevices of treatment that you may not be able to get from a general practitioner. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, if people are watching this and maybe don't know where to find a movement disorder specialist near you or, you know, have questions about that, please uh, feel free to reach out. We will always help you find the closest person to you that has a specialty. So, um, okay, great. Uh, so you mentioned depression. There's two questions about depression that I'm going to kind of combine. Yeah. One is, um, is depression, is the depression because of the reducing dopamine? And then the other is, do antidepressants help? Yeah, uh, great, great questions. Uh, so 
depression can come in many forms in Huntington's disease. There's something called reactive depression, which is a, knowing that you have a, a, a disorder. And uh, I always try to put myself in people's shoes. And, and I know that if I woke up every morning and I, in the back of my mind, I had, I have Huntington's disease or I have Parkinson's or I have something of that nature, it would be hard. It's, it's hard to, to kind of overcome this. And uh, so my job is to, you know, provide hope, but, but, the point being that, that that alone can cause some of the depression that people see in these disorders. Then you're very, very, very smart and very accurate because dopamine is related to depression um, as well. We see it more commonly, well actually we see it as commonly in Huntington's as with Parkinson's disease. Um, dopamine is definitely involved in the regulation of your mood. And so uh, interestingly, the replacement or treatment for depression is not a dopamine replacer, it is a serotonergic replacer. It's called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, so these are definitely helpful. I tell every one of my patients who comes in and admits to me, I have to use that term admits, please don't feel stigmatized. So much of our population, this is not just Huntington's Parkinson's, suffers from depression. Uh, there's such a taboo about it. I think there's a, there's more of an advance recently to kind of overcome this stigma, but we there's a huge proportion of our society that suffers from this, and and uh, it shouldn't be a stigma. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be looked down on, um, and it is pretty well easily treated. Um, there's two ways to go about it. Therapy I think is always important. I have a kind of mentality about interventions. Start low. Start with things that are not going to cause side effects, medications, etc. If you can do that and take care of it, fantastic. If not, then yeah, there are medications. There's SSRIs, SNRIs. Um, there's a lot of other mood stabilizing medications that have uh, adjunctive properties for antidepressants, such as Abilify. Um, so if that were to, can, to happen, and I do look for that in Huntington's disease also. One interesting note, suicidality is often not due to depression, it's due to impulsivity. And so, so I think that it's something that doctors should consider when they prescribe an SSRI, because if you're inducing a manic state, which can occur in some people who appear depressed, there can be a little bit of underlying bipolar. If you induce that manic state, there's more of a risk for, for a suicidality and that impulsivity. So something to be cautioned about. Ultimately, yes, that can be treated. Um, it should be talked about with your doctor. Don't be shy. Everybody has a chance, so your doctor's got a little bit of it. And uh, yeah, just don't worry about it and, and bring it up. Oh, that's fantastic. And it also, I think, too, brings up the component, again, I'm going to say of a movement disorder specialist who understands some of those nuances of how, you know, the, the best case medications need to even be monitored to make sure that you don't go too far. You know, it is a delicate balance, isn't it? It is definitely, definitely. It, it's a teeter totter, and uh, you have to be right in the middle. And if you're not, um, then there's problems. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just always, always understand that every medication you take will have a side effect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is the prevalence of HD in the U.S.? That's a great question. I believe it's approximately one out of every one hundred thousand people uh, currently. Um, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but that, that does trans, I, I'm fairly confident about that answer. Um, so, okay. so it's about the prevalence of ALS, um, which I think has a lot more uh, uh, recognition at this point in time than Huntington's disease. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're right between um, celebrities and then the ice bucket challenge, right? That everybody knows yeah. from the, <laughs> sometimes things that aren't related still like raise awareness. Yeah, we were, I, I discussed this with somebody and I think that we, there probably have been celebrities who do have Huntington's and I think there's a little right. bit more of a stigma with Huntington's than with ALS. ALS is more of it just affects your motor. Huntington's starts affecting your cognition and your behavior and people are, are afraid to kind of open up and show that weakness and that vulnerability. And I think that's part of the reason that we don't have the same awareness mm -hmm. that we should. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and you talked a little about um, interpreting facial expression. So if someone is asking, um, they're really struggling with that with a family member. Um, and it doesn't go into detail. So I'm assuming that the struggle might be um, both the person interpreting the facial expression. If, if you want me to clarify, send another question, but can you share a little more about the interpreting facial expression challenges? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so what it means is essentially that the, 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 
the person with Huntington's disease has difficulty seeing when somebody else's face, seeing that this would mean sad or this would mean happy and, and being able, it's called, it's prosody. And so that's actually the form of the, the voice, but, but it's a recognition of these facial, uh, these facial expressions and what they indicate. Um, it's a kind of a insight issue in general um, that you can see and identify what these facial expressions mean, but the next layer is uh, comprehending what those facial expressions indicate. And, and so that's, that's the difficulty that people with Huntington's can have. Insight, okay, that makes sense. Um, somebody wants to know, does exercise help? Exercise helps everything. Please exercise, please exercise, please exercise. So we, we um, neurodegenerative disorders uh, are, are difficult to treat. We don't have cures yet. I'm hopeful for this clinical trial, but Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, we don't have cures yet. Uh, we're working on it um, and trust me, I want them as much as you do. Uh, in the meantime, exercise. We, we, we know that exercise slows the progression for Parkinson's disease. I don't think it has been technically proven with Huntington's, but I, I will bet my bottom dollar that it does help. When you exercise, you produce something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, and this allows uh, neuronal growth. And, and uh, although technically we haven't proven that there's been uh, any kind of regeneration of neurons within the central nervous system, um, there is this theory that the exercise does help the, the sprouting of new neurons and connections and things of that nature. Um, everything points towards that both in mouse models and also in real humans. Um, exercise also makes you feel better. So, so exercise will improve your mood. It helps release endorphins. Um, it is a great way to, to feel better, to do better, to live longer, and to be healthier. Perfect. Exercise, exercise. I'm going to have exercise, to look at this. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Yes, perfect. Um, and, uh, okay, so a question. Um, my dad has HD and now my brother. Will my brother's HD be more serious or intense? Does it? Does the disease strengthen over generations? Yes, it technically should, but that's not always the case. So again, it goes back to this term anticipation. The idea that the, uh, let's say there's this amount of CAG repeats in, in dad, and then in your brother, it might be longer. It might be more with more clumps that can affect the areas of the brain. But it depends. It depends on every person. It not only depends upon if there's just more repeats, it depends upon the environment. It depends upon, there's the nature and the nurture is what I'm getting at. So, so um, uh, you know, your father went through a hard time. There was not a lot of treatments for Huntington's disease. There was not a lot of awareness for Huntington's disease. Um, that's increasing, that's improving. So your brother may potentially have more of these CAG repeats, which would predict that there should be a, a worse course of the disease over time. But with the new interventions and everything, you could have more CAG repeats, but be treated better, more managed more appropriately. And, and those symptoms could do a lot better. So, so tech, the first step I would do would be to look at the CAG repeats from dad and from your brother, see if there are more that would indicate that potentially things could be worse. And then if that's the case, I would watch a little bit more closely, know that there are a lot of treatments. I would, would definitely get to a movement disorder specialist um, and, and consider the trial. Um, this, this is a very, very positive trial. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> okay, a question um, or question slash statement. My, my, I'm familiar with Huntington's disease. My son has Huntington's and his outbursts are exhausting for me. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, yeah. So again, I would speak with your physician. I just want to clarify and throw a little disclaimer out there. But, um, but, but if the, the mood uh, symptoms are prevalent enough, then um, the Abilify can be a good way to manage that aripiprazole. Um, I, I find that that kind of controls the mood without causing the uh, side effect of the potential Parkinsonism. Uh, it's a little bit better than that. There are other agents that people use called Risperdal and Seroquel, which are a little bit more intense and a little bit more sedating. Uh, the Abilify seems to be milder, and it can also help control the chorea and if there is any kind of tick movement as well. Perfect. Um, Ma, is Huntington's linked to pain? Huntington's is not linked to pain uh, that I know of. Um, Parkinson's, there's definitely been a link to pain. Huntington's, not as much. Um, the, the, the one interesting thing, I'm getting a bit up tan off the tangent, is... is uh, uh, that Huntington's will cause weight loss, a lot of weight loss. 
people are constantly moving and also the part of the brain that's affected um, just causes the brain to metabolize more quickly. So, so uh, a bit tangential uh, to answer the question, no, not that I know of, there's not an association between Huntington's and pain. Um, one other thing I will say that I can think of is that pain will increase the intensity of chorea or any tremor, any movement disorder. Pain, pain has an effect like that, so. Um, is there a resource to find Huntington's research opportunities like Fox Trial Finder? I am in Ohio. Great question. The Huntington Disease Society of America has a good amount of, um, of information on this. There's also a website called HD Buzz that kind of keeps up. It's a, a more of a grassroots kind of effort, and uh, that's, that's really good. Uh, I'm very proud of the people who put that together. They do a lot of work out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, just like you, Sarah. I appreciate it. And... Uh, um, yeah, those are, those are two very good ones. Clinicaltrials.gov. Also, you can type in Generation HD and it should list uh, the, the sites for the trial. And how many did you say were happening across the country right now? Like 20 I believe 15. 15? 15? 15, okay. I believe 15 sites, 15 or 17. How long will that study be? Two Is years. That a, two yeah. years. Yeah, two years. It's intensive. Okay. It involves uh, lumbar punctures and uh, injection of the medication through a spinal tap. Um, but I consider it worth it. Yeah, sometimes, it, you know, the disease itself is intensive. So if there's an opportunity to actually find benefit, that's, that's phenomenal. Exactly. Um, okay, I, we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, sleep. I wonder if melatonin helps with sleep. Great question. So I'm a huge fan of melatonin. Uh, this is introduced to me by my fellowship director. I used to think melatonin was just water and would do nothing. Melatonin works great. Um, it's the most benign, I, I, most benign quote unquote medication I could ever prescribe. Melatonin is in all of our brains. When the sun goes down, our brain produces melatonin to release our, to regulate our circadian rhythm. And so it does help regulate our sleep-wake cycle. Um, that is often disturbed in Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease and some other disorders. People act out their dreams commonly, and that's called REM behavioral disorder, and melatonin is a great treatment. Unfortunately, a lot of physicians jump straight to the clonazepam, Xanax, things of that nature, the ones with the side effects that will not help your cognition if you have Huntington's disease. It's also not going to help energy level, things of that nature. You get very fatigued, can cause imbalance. Um, Ambien is also notorious, as everyone probably here knows, the sleepwalking is kind of the, the big thing for Ambien. So, so melatonin for me is the first thing I would definitely try. Um, there's over-the-counter versions of melatonin, then there's uh, uh, prescription versions. I've heard anecdotally that the prescription versions are a little bit more accurate in the amount of dosing that they have, um, but I think either one would be okay. Um, usually up to 10 milligrams is a good amount. Anything more than that, they consider maybe paradoxical, like it could actually cause more less sleep, um, but it works great and I would definitely try that if, that's a, if it's an issue. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, is there something that we can do to help with the anxiety? Yeah. So, excuse me. So, so there's a, excuse me, again, I, I think of myself in, in people's shoes with Huntington's disease. And if, if I had Huntington's disease, the, 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 the disease, and usually as it's genetic, uh, you're, you're going to have seen probably a parent who, who goes through this. And that, that's probably the most dramatic thing to see. Everybody I know who's had a parent go through something and then gets it, it's, it's, it's very hard for them. So that's going to induce anxiety right there. Uh, secondly, the diagnosis, not knowing what to expect, that's going to induce anxiety as well. Third, the portion of the disease as the behavioral uh, component can cause anxiety as well. So you've got to try it of things that can cause anxiety. Anxiety makes everything worse. Anxiety builds everything up. If you're anxious, you're going to have more chorea. If you have more chorea, you're going to get more anxious. It's going to make you panic. So definitely want to address this. Um, the best medications to address anxiety are antidepressants. Uh, they prevent anxiety rather than acutely put a Band-Aid on it, which is what clonazepam and other benzodiazepines are meant for. Um, I would not recommend benzodiazepines uh, in the setting of Huntington's disease. It just, just isn't going to help. It's going to cause more risk for falls, uh, choking, things of that nature. Um, so I would, I would first talk about therapy again, take the stepwise approach, and then, and then discuss whether or not an antidepressant would help with the anxiety as well. 
Wonderful. And do you find, you know, I know like for uh, Parkinson's disease and some of the other um, movement disorders, it's really helpful when people sort of keep a diary of when things happen. And do you find that that's also helpful for Huntington's disease? I do and I don't. I, I go back and forth because uh, I, I, this, my job in my mind is to coming, coming to a doctor is not fun. Let's just be honest. Nobody, when you come to a doctor, you're coming with a problem and it's usually not a fun thing to do. So what I want to do is kind of get that over with, get, get, let's deal with the medical problems. Take your, a diary can be helpful and that you can compile a great list of problems and I can see time-wise what has happened and it'll help me more accurately kind of pinpoint, but that is at the cost of constantly thinking about all of your symptoms. So, so what I would ideally love is you live your life. You don't think about these diseases. Let me handle that. We'll, we'll work on that when you come in to see me. Um, there's an in-between. Uh, you don't want to ne neglect things completely, but also don't, don't hyper-focus. Live your life. You have, may have a disease, but it doesn't define you. And so please, please enjoy and live your life, and, and we'll, we'll try to do the rest. Wow. You are just refreshing, and your care and... Um your care and compassion, but also your passion just comes through. Um, I think that people are going to want to clone you um, <laughs> because, because I, it's I, really I encouraging. I tell my, a lot of my patients that, so thank you very much. <laughs> it's, yeah. really, uh, it's really encouraging. It's a, you know, I think, um, I think that one of the things that you talked about as a movement disorder specialist and when you were in that fork in the road deciding where you wanted to go, you know, it's, it is a long-term relationship that you have with people. Yes. Yeah, that was the most important thing. Thank you for bringing that up. That, that was because stroke is, stroke is amazing. You can, you can give TPA and, and eliminate a stroke, but movement disorders, I, I get to see this. It's the most moving thing in my life. People, many of my patients I consider like my family members, and, and I truly love and, and appreciate the inspiration that, that everyone gives me. So thank you. I'm honored to be in this field. And um, so, and Dr. Blewett is, um, of course, out of Stanford. And when, if someone lives where maybe there's not a movement disorder specialist, or maybe they want to come see you, when somebody sees a movement disorder specialist, they don't necessarily need to see the movement disorder specialist every, you know, two months or something, right? I mean, so it, it can be something, even if you live at a distance, mm -hmm. um, it's not super frequent. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Totally accurate, 100% accurate. The different ways you can do it. If you really live far, I, I had somebody come see me from you know kind of across the country, and and I, I can see them once and then work with their physician locally to kind of manage the care. There's there is a legality involved that you do need to establish care with somebody in order to to be able to give medical advice. So you definitely have to see the the, the movement disorder physician. However, after that, um, the, the appointments are up to you. Um, and, and you may just want to go annually, uh, just get, get kind of a checkup, make sure everything is going right and have your local physician uh, give the recommendations or the local physician can work with us. Um, it should be always be about you when you go to see a doctor. It should always be about you're getting better and, and you know, that, that's the ultimate decision. Mm -hmm. it, and I am going to put right now, I, I actually closed it, unfortunately. I want to pull up your contact information and put that into the chat um, for people. We also have it on our website too. And when we post this to YouTube, we'll make sure that that is um, on there as well. But I know we always get the question of how do I get a hold of this doctor and how do I find this doctor? Um, so I've just put his uh, Stanford contact right there on, on the chat as well. Um, this was phenomenal. Um, I'm very excited about Generation HD and we look forward to having you back anytime you have any updates you wanna share with us. Um, and also, um, you know, making sure that people know how to access that, find a, find a trial near you um, and be a part of it. Um, it's yeah, an and opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. This is an honor. Uh, everybody out there, thank you for, for listening. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. And it really is an honor. I love, I love doing this. This is my life's mission, and, and I appreciate this opportunity. Well, you are a gift 
to the community. And I'm so grateful for, for you sharing your time with um, PMD Alliance. And, um, and also I should make sure that people know that if you live in a place where you don't have maybe exercise or support groups, um, we do have um, live stream exercise. It's available. It's, it's a safe thing to do from home. It's not a, a highly robust. Um, we don't want people falling. Um, so it, but it is a good exercise um, for people with movement disorders. We have live stream um, uh, exercise class that happens three times a week. And um, we also are partnered with um, an organization that uses this particular Zoom um, technology and has um, support groups for people uh, with, impacted by Huntington's disease. And so um, if you wanna know more about that, you can look on our website or reach out to us. And again, um, if you have difficulty tracking down Dr. Blewett, we will help you um, get connected with him. And thank you again for your time today. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Thanks. Have a good day. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.